Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, 500 Years of Raphael. We are joined by art historian and advisor, Alard von Rohr de Mien, as he traces the history of this angel who fell from heaven. Alard will explore and discuss Raphael's short but beautiful life, his extraordinary genius and influence on artists of the 20th and 21st century, including Pablo Picasso, Andy Warhol, and Cindy Sherman. Since 2006, Allard has led the Deutsche Bank's collection team for, uh, of art consultants in London, and he is the Deutsche Bank's chief art lecturer for London's annual Fries and Fries Masters Arts Fair. This program is part of a three-part series presented in partnership with the American Friends of the Louvre. Thank you to everyone involved for making this event possible. Following the conversation will be a brief uh, presentation, sorry, will be a brief Q&A. So please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. So everybody can focus on the presentation. The chat will be disabled for this event. And without further ado, here is Alart. Please enjoy the program. Very good evening from London. Um, of course, I'm thrilled to be here and um, be able to present Raphael's life to you. Uh, thank you, Nadine. And uh, thank you for the New York Arts Club to um, put this together, together with the American Friends of the Louvre. I have had the great pleasure of traveling um, with um, the American Friends of the Louvre to a variety of destinations over the years. It's always been great fun. Um, Christopher Forbes has always led the most wonderful group um, to places as far afield as the Emirates, to Vienna, uh, to various other destinations. And so we're all stuck at home with nothing to do. So this is a nice way to spend an evening commemorating the life of one of the great geniuses of uh, the Renaissance. Um, yes, last April, we commemorated 500 years since the death of Raphael, when he was born in 1483. I would say that 99.9% of Europe was still in the deepest, darkest Middle Ages. And by the time he died in 1520, one can distinctly say that the light of modern age Europe is on the horizon. It will take another 250 years for that light to become less an artistic, but a political and social force through the age of reason, through the enlightenment, through the French Revolution, through the American Declaration of Independence and the Rights of Man. But then, then in 1520, when Raphael died at the age of 37, he had unleashed this light, at least in the arts, and brought it to its apex in Rome. Um, it's an extraordinary achievement, specifically thinking that this light isn't just the painterly light of the Renaissance as it invades the perspective of constructions of the early Florentine painters. It's also a symbolic light. It is the light that invades the hearts and minds of the people of the Middle Ages as they wake up from the superstitions and the reveries of a hundred years and many more of um, medieval times. So Raphael was born into a painter's family. We'll have the first image, please. He was very successful at um, working with his father. The father was a court painter to the Dukes of Urbino. And um, this is where he learned his social graces. It was the classic North 
Italian court where the leaders wanted to be more than just feudal overlords, but actually partake in the great humanist and Renaissance discoveries of the time. And so this is the atmosphere in which Raphael grew up. The father painted um, Madonnas, of course. He painted portraits of the Montefeltro family. And he also dabbled in various literary exercises, a typical Renaissance man of his day. Sadly, the father died, as did the mother. And by the age of 11, Raphael was an orphan. And he was handed into the workshop of Perugino. Perugino, meaning the painter from Perugia in Umbria, where he continued his apprenticeship. And this is where you first get a good sense of what Raphael was so excellent at throughout his life. He was great at absorbing the influences of other artists to a point and then propelling them in a completely new direction through his own ingenuity. Here we have a typical Piroginesque painting. This is by Pierogino himself. You can see he's very much absorbed the great discoveries of the Florentine Renaissance. You can see it's a coherent perspective of construction with a foreground with people and furniture and a middle ground with architecture and a background with landscape. Everything is orderly. Everything recedes to a vanishing point. You can see a harmonious light source, voluminous bodies moving freely around this stage. This is um, Perugino at his best, a serene, beautiful construction showing a sacred conversation between Saint Bernard and the Virgin Mary with attendant angels. We'll take the next image, which will be the first one that Raphael creates. And you can see immediately how in many ways this is perfectly um, Peruginesque. He has absorbed all the great lessons, but the first great difference you see is he has banished the twilight of the Gothic interiors of Perugino and instead replaced it with the clearest light of day with a bright single white arch leading into this beautiful domed landscape. Raphael absorbs these great lessons and pushes them further. You feel he instantly thinks Perugino uses too many figures. He reduces them. He instantly thinks, I don't think I'd remember any of those figures' faces and gives his faces more character. Look at that beautiful John the Baptist on the left. Look at the way Raphael exercises in a piece of real virtuoso foreshortening as the head tilts backwards, upwards, and sideways at the same time with um, the St. John the Baptist in his camel tunic and prophet's cloak pointing at the little baby Jesus. On the other side, um, an elderly gentleman, St. Nicholas, looking down, the gesture of the virile man on the left being counteracted by the gesture of a contemplative intellectual on the right. And in the middle, this wonderful Madonna, already much more alive than anything you would have known before. In fact, as much as Raphael was an idealist, he was also utterly a realist. And he thought, if baby Jesus is indeed supposed to be the future, god of the heavens as a child he still wouldn't be able to read so there's the virgin pointing out the pictures in the little catechism that she's reading these are the wonderful lessons absorbed and pushed beyond perugino in the years when he is in perugia working for this great master of the renaissance and then as every self-respecting ambitious artist of the time he moves to florence in 1504. And there he absorbs all the influence of the early Renaissance. That is the fulcrum of the Renaissance. He absorbs Donatello and Masaccio and Ghiberti and Uccello and of course Botticelli. And as luck will have it, one other great artist happens to be resident between 1504 and 1508 also in Florence. If you have the next picture, please, um, you will find that you can already see in here an inference of this master. I'm going to take you on a journey now which tracks the history of Raphael's pictorial and intellectual development via the Virgin Mary and the Christ Child. 
people often complain that Raphael painted one Madonna after the other and it gets boring. And I get irritated with that because of course we don't say that about Rothko or Clifford Still who have reduced their tools to a very few and have moved those on and intellectually evolved treading paths that no human being has ever trodden just with the few instruments of their composition. And in that way, Raphael is very similar. The whole trajectory of his development can be traced through his Madonnas. Um, actually, this is a little bit before he goes to Florence and you still see a lot of Perugino. This is the wonderful Pasadena Madonna. Um, and you can sense Perugino in the simple balanced arrangement, the eyes cast down of the Virgin. She is still a bucolic, naive, the perfect blend of naivety and spiritual intensity that would make this the sort of meditative work that would be very high on the market in those days. Arriving in Florence, he encounters this artist. I deliberately refrain from giving the name because I'm sure you can recognize if you see the next image. This is by Raphael, but it could just as well be by the other artist. And of course, I shan't tantalize you any further if of course it is Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was the great polymath, the superstar of the time. And even though I don't believe Raphael ever met Leonardo in Florence, he certainly was under his influence. And you can see it very clearly over here. First of all, you can see a rigorous geometricization of the composition. I've deliberately left the corners white because then you can see this is a square into which it is inserted a circle, which is then halved into two hemispheres on in front of which is placed a triadic, a triangular composition. This geometry is fascinates Leonardo da Vinci and anyone who is looking for neoplatonic grandeur, who is seeking in mathematics, in geometry, the secrets of the universe. And it is beautifully applied over here, not only for its own sake, but also to enliven the dynamics of the relationships. Because if you see, the triadic arrangement also creates a wonderful interplay of glances as the Virgin looks down at the Christ child, as the Christ child plays with his band, uh, hands it to St. John the Baptist. He casts his look back to the little Christ child. On the other side, you see an angel and he um, reflects his glance back to the Virgin. So you have a wonderful interplay of psychological complexities brought about by geometry. Leonardo da Vinci wasn't too keen on bright colors. And again, you can see this over here. There's a great sense of muted colors. These are the main instruments which Raphael absorbs. Now there's one specific quote, which is actually a copy. And in those days, that was an homage, not a piece of plagiarism. It is this beautifully foreshortened hand of the Virgin Mary. You'll see it in the next image created much earlier by Leonardo da Vinci. Of course, the Madonna of the Grotto. There is the hand shattering the picture plane. But other than that, you find that many things Raphael does not particularly like. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the three great artists of his time, alongside Michelangelo and Raphael, probed deep into the mysteries of creation. He was as interested in geology and biology and mathematics and geometry as he was in optics, in the way light falls and transmits itself. These were all parts of his interest and painting was just one of those many disciplines he dabbled in. So Raphael, who was a born and bred painter, thinks very differently. The next image will show that. Here you can see, yes, he still has a triadic composition. This is the beautiful Madonna of the Meadows painted in 1505, spank in the middle when he was in Florence. And yes, you still have this wonderful interplay of glances um, propelled by the parameter organization. But already there, Raphael thinks, actually, I don't like these crepuscular grotto colors. I like the light of day. And so he presents a beautiful light of day with brilliantly lit colors. There, the Virgin wears this beautiful gold bordered blue vestment set against a red dress. Um, in front of a brown background and the last the background 
is in bright blues to create that sense of distance. Colors are used over here to convey the richness of painterly potential, and of course, also to show off closeness, which is in warm colors, as to distance, which is in cooler blue colors, something which actually Raphael picked up from the Netherlandish painters. He was much more interested in what's happening in Flanders, and there were a variety of Spanish um, Messene, Spanish patrons in Rome, who would collect these Netherlandish paintings, and Raphael would always be interested in absorbing influences there as well. The, this is a beautiful idyllic scene with only one little um, pointer at the future torment of the Christ child as it innocently grabs the cross. But otherwise, it is Raphael already creating that spectacular equilibrium between clarity of form and power of expression, which will be his trademark and which we, he's going to refine over the years. And we'll take the next image. Here, Raphael Clear says, I'm getting bored with three, four people. Let's mix it up a little bit. Let's create a holy family. This is the famous Canigiano family from 1507. And also he plays another game. He uses color over here, not only to create beautiful effects, but also as psychological metaphors. I'll just take you back to your um, color lessons from school time. You may remember that there are three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. They are the most important, they're pure, they're indivisible. And the Virgin monopolizes two of them. She has the red and she has the blue. The yellow is partly what Joseph, her husband, is cloaked in. He isn't quite so pure. Don't forget, he's actually not the father of the Christ child. So he doesn't deserve more than one primary color. Let's put it that way. If you now mix blue and red, you get purple. There's the aunt on the left in her shimmering gown of purple. She is a sideshow. If you mix blue and yellow, you get green. That's the hybrid in Joseph, who will really be more a guardian than an actual father. We all know who the father is. And if you mix red and orange, you sort of add insult to injury with Joseph. It's his face. His face is orange. He's a very simple suntanned man. Let's not forget that suntan was considered bucolic and common. So Raphael has used the order of the chromatic spectrum as a carrier of metaphors for the hierarchy inherent in the Holy Family. It's a wonderful way of using painterly um, expertise to create something symbolic and interesting. In 1508, Raphael gets a letter. He is called to Rome at the intercession of his friend, Donato Bramante, the great architect who will build St. Peter's in Rome. And he will be called by Julius, the then new Pope, to redecorate some of his apartments. He's just become Pope, and here I'll take you a little bit back into the history of the papacy at that time, which is fascinating because you may remember that the papacy at the time was in deep trouble because the one document upon which the Catholic Church rested its claim to territorial as, in, as well as spiritual powers, the donation of Constantine had been outed as a fake. Constantine was the first Christian emperor, and he had granted sweeping imperial and territorial powers as a Roman emperor in the fourth century CE to the Catholic Church. And it was upon this claim, upon this document, that the Catholic Church kept up its claim to holding both the golden and the silver keys over every faithful human being, meaning the claim over his spiritual salvation, his or hers, and indeed over its lands, estates, and pockets. Now this was outed as a fake, this document, and of course there was a vacuum. Suddenly the Pope had no claim to territories anymore and the great nations in the region that were beginning to form, Spain and Germany and France invaded Italy and grabbed bits and bobs and annexed it. And it is into this situation that Julian is elected as Pope. That's interesting, he calls himself Julius, Julius II. 
There is no real reason for that other than the simple fact that he wants to be the new Julius Caesar. He wants to be the man who expels in an armory. He never wore his papal cloaks. He was always in an armory, expelled the barbarians and reunite Italy only now under Catholic rule, under Catholic leadership with him and his progeny of popes as prince bishops being both in charge of people's spiritual salvation and indeed the politics of the land. That is his mission, and that is what Raphael is supposed to paint onto the walls of the library, which he will fresco first in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican. Next image, please. He, Raphael, is given a lot of advice as to what to do. He's supposed to paint four frescoes for the library, uh, where Julius will receive all the political delegations, and he must make sure that there's a very strong program on the walls. Uh, the most important thing is he needs to prove that he has to solve Julius, the Pope, the discrepancies between Greek Roman paganism and Judeo Christian religion of the day, that there is no break in the continuity, that one was just a pavement to the next. And so this library in which all the great books will be stored will show four walls with the four great pillars of European culture painted onto the walls. There will be literature, both pagan and Christian. There will be Jewish jurisprudence, both Roman law and canonical law. There will be theology, which is what you're looking at over here. And there will be pagan philosophy. Here we have theology. This is um, what Ratha paints. He paints what's called a disputatio, a disputation. A disputation is a moment when the great and the good of the Catholic Church come together and discuss whether something should be elevated to a God-given doctrine. Over here, they discuss, and you can see it's not just the living academia of the day, it's everybody in heaven presided over by God himself. You can see him at the heart in the middle at the top with his diamond shaped halo, they're presiding over the discussion as to the transubstantiation of the host. You can see the host here right at the center. This is the point of discussion. And of course, it's very important to cement Julius's power of whoever enters to, to the library because he, the claim is with this doctrine that only by the intercession and agency of a Catholicly ordained priest will the host during the celebration of the Eucharist magically transubstantiate into the body of Christ and thereby administer salvation to all the ones who are present witnessing the Eucharist. In other words, it means only the Catholic Church can send people to heaven or hell, depending on whether they're going to refuse or administer the sacrament. So you have this amazing image, and I think it's a bit of a foregone conclusion that it'll pass. The motion will be passed, because if you look closely, God is present, Jesus is present, just run your axis through the center, and then you can see a dove, that's the Holy Ghost, and the dove actually secretes a kind of gold liquid right onto the host. That's very clear. Basically, the miraculous properties of the host are fed by the Holy Ghost himself. So this means that anyone entering basically is at the mercy of Julius II. You can see him sitting for, from the altar to the left. There's a man sitting there in a triple tier tiara, transfixed by the host. Now, Julius would never have been so impudent as to place himself there personally. This is meant to be Gregory the Great, another of the very active poets of the past. But Gregory the Great definitely has Julius II's face grafted onto his head. So you really feel he is present there, transfixed by the truth that is just about to be declared. And anyone entering the library would be feeling very much that Julius says, OK, you may have superior armies, you may have superior administrations and state apparatuses, but believe me, 
I'm in charge of his soul. And if you don't do as I tell you, you and all the people you work for will go to hell. So beautifully created, very subliminally subtexted the great disputatio representing theology. Next image, please. I wanted to show you once the whole room. Just look at the, the doors in the distance. It gives you a sense of how large these are, these rooms. And also to give you a sense of Raphael's marvelous command over overall compositions. He has painted everything in this room except for the floor, which is a mosaic. And don't forget everything's painted. Everything that looks like a sculpture is painted. Everything that looks like a cameo or a relief, it is all painted. Even the borders of these lunettes are painted in illusion. It's a great masterpiece, a great ensemble. And we move on to the next image, which of course is the counterpart to theology philosophy. Now, what I would love you to do is, I would love you to once imagine the space without people, just spirit the people away. And you begin to realize what Raphael has created. He has literally created a vast space, a precursor of what later will be the, at that point in time, unbuilt St. Peter's in Rome. You can literally, if you start from the beginning, walk across this few steps, enter into a brightly lit lobby, then you go beyond that into the first slightly shady tunnel vault covered in octagonal coffers. It's a very complex thing to paint if you foreshorten it. Then you continue into a place that is so brightly lit there must be a dome with a clear story. You go beyond that into another tunnel vault lit from both sides a little lighter, then into an open courtyard and in the distance a triumph arch. This is a masterful piece of illusory architecture, and it really shows Raphael's command for architecture as much as painting. Interesting enough, it's not nature. You may remember the disputation took place in nature. That was God-given. This is philosophy that's man-made and could be ruined. And there, bring all the philosophers back, you see all the great and the good of the Greek-Roman philosophical pantheon. At the heart of it, you can see a man dressed in red in the distance, in the mid distance, and a man dressed in blue. Those are the two great schools of thought that also influenced theology later. On the left, you have Plato. On the right, you have Aristotle. Next image, please. There you can see Plato. And lo and behold, he looks like Leonardo da Vinci. Clearly, again, a man who Rafa wants to pay homage to. He points upwards because, as you know, Plato always said God first had ideas and then he made them into objects and these are just compromised copies. So the ideas came first. He holds his Timaeo, the only book known by Plato at that point in time. On the other side is Aristotle. He says, hold on, he comes, the fiery Plato down. I don't quite believe that. I believe that God did make an idea and he did turn it into a copy, but that the whole point of creation is, is for that copy to re-evolve into the idea. These are very complex philosophical thoughts, Plato versus, versus Aristotle expressed in paint. Interesting enough, if you look at Plato, he's striding forward, whereas Aristotle is standing still. That means basically that the Renaissance is really on, on the side of Plato as the more progressive. This is the great moment of Neoplatonism. We'll have the next image, please. And here we have the whole great and the good of philosophy. I'll point out just a few. If you go from Plato in red at the center, to the left, you can see a man in a kind of olive green. That's, of course, Socrates, who is engaging in a dialectic dialogue. He invented that form of truth finding with Alexander the Great. He's the one with that flamboyant helmet. And um, you get a sense of how Socrates, who, of course, um, taught Plato, um, is very much also at the heart of proceedings. If you go to Aristotle's side and go down, a man lying in a kind of semi recumbent posture on the stairs. That is Diogenes, the great philosopher and founder of the cynics. The cynics said, basically, we will um, renounce all human luxuries and privileges and become dogs again. Cynic means dog. 
it was the first anti-establishment movement of the time. Thereby, he lies on the floor like a dog limpidly um, waiting for his master's orders. If you go again to Plato's side, right to the front, you can see a man um, rather morose looking with his elbow supported by a somewhat displaced piece of marble. That is Heraclitus, the fiery philosopher Heraclitus. He um, has another face grafted onto him. Lo and behold, it's Michelangelo. Michelangelo was really at odds with Raphael. He was deeply envious of him. And this is a quiet revenge of Raphael's. He's turned Michelangelo into the fiery choleric Heraclitus right there at the front, morose and very disgruntled at the fact that Raphael has these long audiences with the popes whilst he is often banished into the quarters. You can actually see Raphael himself as well. If you go to the very far right at the bottom, you could see a man draped in white and then a little face peeking out. That's Raphael himself. He has positioned himself among the philosophers. I'm not just a lowly artisan, I'm a thinker on the lines of the great and the good of the Greek philosophers. Next image, please. You can see another direct copy. It looks like the Heraclitus with Michelangelo's face grafted on. And of course, it's Raphael's quote of the weeping philosopher Jeremiah in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So these court little hints at quotes would have delighted many of the people and infuriated Michelangelo himself. We'll take the next image. And here, once more, look at the whole. I just wanted you to show the whole once more because, of course, one of the greatest assets to Raphael is the way he can marshal a large crowd, giving you a sense of crowding, a sense of animation of society, and yet making sure that every individual stays autonomous. He is one of the great um, choreographers of group scenes. He's unparalleled until the arrival of Poussin several centuries later. We go on to the next image, please. And we'll run through a couple of images because I can see we're already heading to the end. This is another of the great assets of Raphael's portraiture. He is portraiting over here Julius II. Now, to us, this seems fairly conventional. At the time, it would have been the most shocking image you'd see. It would be utterly shocking for the simple reason that Raphael has turned the Pope to the side. He's angled him rather than what one's used to with sovereigns. They face you frontally, fixing you with their eyes. This gives people a chance to investigate this terrifying Pope who would lead his own battles and lead his armies to fight anything from the French to the Spanish. Over here, he's grown a beard in mortification at having lost Bologna to the French. It is a wonderful portrait of a man um, beautifully executed by Raphael, both in the precision and realism as in the luxurious color composition. We'll have the next image. After Julius came Leo X, he was a Medici Pope. And again, not very flattering, puffy face, short sighted. You can see he's holding a little magnifying glass. This is again, Raphael turning portraiture a little bit to the side, allowing the viewer in on what is really a very solemn moment. This is Leo X, uh, affable, lazy Pope who really wanted the easy way out. And of course he made the big mistake of selling indulgences to the Germans. You may remember that was the moment when they needed money for the Vatican and Leo X came up with the idea that one could sell indulgences, which would be vouchers, which the imbecile Germans would buy and then their time in purgatory would be shortened according to the price they paid. And of course, the whole thing then launched Martin Luther's protestations, the Reformation and the ultimate schism. You can feel over here, despite of the luxuries, the velvets, the damasks, there's tension in the air because of this very ominous situation that is evolving in 1518 as this is painted. Next image, please. Here, I want to pick up the story of the Madonnas because all the time Raphael's painting Madonnas and you really feel 
the evolution of the presentation of the woman has launched itself into a new state. Before you had the handmaidens of God, beautiful women, then you had objects of Neoplatonic beauty and suddenly you have an autonomous, independent woman flying into a room, eyes upwards, fixing you the way really only a sovereign does, beautiful, perfectly in harmony with their environment and yet definitely in control. On the side, you can see Sixtus IV, again with Julius's face grafted on, asking basically the Monana, will you take me with you? Can I commend you to your protection and take me to heaven? Both had been really very fearsome, often criminalized popes, and there the Madonna is supposed to help. This is one of the great icons of um, the representation of women through the ages. She's woken up from her medieval reverie and she fixes you with great confidence. Another one we'll do very quickly, um, the next image, please. You can see here the Madonna de la Seggiola. This is the Madonna sitting on an armchair. Basically, Raphael's pushed her right up to the picture plane so that we can look at her, or rather really that she can look at us and look at her. She's a peasant woman. She's sitting on the cathedral, the papal throne, but she's basically wrapped her arms around her child for the first time. Raphael actually investigates what this mother must be going through. The child looks a little fearful, probably ogling its own future. Little John the Baptist is offering his little prayers to save his own head. He's going to lose that later and that of his cousin. She basically says, I don't care if you're God or man, you're not going to get close to that child. It is my child. I'm a mother first and an object of the universe later. A wonderful reappraisal of the woman away from her role as the mother of Christ. And the next image, please. And here we come to one of the most famous paintings. This is the painting that stood, still stood on the easel of Raphael Studio when he died in 1520. Um, there have been so many um, speculative theories as to who this is. I think we can all agree it probably is his mistress, Margarita Luti, later renamed the baker's woman, La Fornarina. Um, you can see it because she, first of all, is not an idealistic beauty. Secondly, for example, you can see her class. She has a bit of sunburn. You can see where the sun didn't get where the straps were of her dress. Um, and also she has that cryptic smile, rather like the Mona Lisa, which usually identifies um, muse and mistress all in one. Raphael may well have been married to her secretly. In fact, infra-reflectography has revealed that there used to be a ring on the middle finger of her left arm. This painting was probably finished by Giulio Romano because in mid-painting, Raphael died. He probably removed that because he wanted to keep the angel who fell from earth free of any scandal, which would have deeply affected um, his popularity and indeed the popularity of his students and his atelier followers, such as Giulio Romano, very much. So he removed that. On the other hand, it's perfectly clear from the background, there's myrtle. That actually is a symbol of Venus and a symbol of sexual desire. So this is replete with over layerings of ideas. And I do think probably the truth is that this was indeed Margarita Luti and she did um, probably give him a child. You can see she's pressing her breast. That usually means that she may be pregnant because there's milk entering her breasts. She's also covering a slightly larger belly, all signs of a possible pregnancy, perhaps Raphael's child. Anyway, this launched, of course, the great fascination of artists from then onwards of the relationship between the artist and his model. Model both as inspiration and muse, but also as erotic plaything. The next image, please. Here you can see the worst kind of, um, it's a beautiful painting, but the worst kind of effect on Raphael's reputation in the 19th century. This is indeed meant to be Raphael, painted by Auguste Ingres, the great classicist, but it really entrenches all the wrong things about this baker's woman and Raphael and their role. She's sitting rather awkwardly on his lap. He's not even looking at her. He's looking at the ideal version he's going to paint. 
So there is eroticism and idealism both united. And even though she looks out at us in this rather quizzical way, he is center stage and gets his cake and gets to eat it. This is something which many contemporary artists have reacted against. Next image, please. Ha ha, Cindy Sherman restages the whole scene. Basically, she's saying, now hold on, if actually this woman was pregnant and Raphael asked her to sit for, uh, for a, a portrait, Raphael would have had to say, don't worry, I know you're tired. I know your breasts are pressurizing you. Look, they're actually um, attached as um, limbs attached through Cindy Sermon's interaction. And I know you've got a big belly, but do me a favor, just sit for me and I'll airbrush everything out. So basically this is how Cindy Sherman reimagines the real Margarita Luti as she is pressed into service by Raphael with these prosthetic limbs attached to her. And the next image gives you another great debunking of the myth. This is a quite a naughty image by Picasso. He isn't so much against the idea of the nude model that services the artist both in terms of being an inspiration and uh, an erotic object for desire. He just thinks that Raphael probably was as scandalous as any of the Renaissance painters. And there you can see Raphael holding his easel, massive erection on the side, performing cunnilingus whilst painting over her. And Leo X on the, the, the angry Pope on the side, pulling away the curtain, outing this Raphael as being as much a human being, both depraved and saintly as anyone else. It's a wonderful way of Picasso um, debunking this myth, even though of course he was the worst offender when it came to using his models in multiple ways. Next image, please. Here we have more of an homage than a critique. This is a, paint, uh, a photography by Wolfgang Tillmans, the Turner Prize winning German photographer. And you can see instantly it's inspired by the iconic portraitures of Raphael. You find the same color combination. You find the chair moved to an angle. You find the same somewhat remote look of the Madonna. Next image, you'll see how literally um, Tillmans actually uses Raphael's model. You can see how it literally overlaps to create a beautiful photographic version of Raphael's painterly techniques. And we move on again. Here is one of Raphael's greatest uh, drawings. You may know that recently a drawing of his sold for $49 million. So the drawings are as expensive now as Raphael paintings. And it shows one of his great talents, the ability to capture movement. These figures are just about to move and their thoughts about just about to change direction. It's catching something in flux. Now, John Curran, the great painter, was really inspired this, by Raphael's ability to catch movement, both spiritual and physical, in drawing. Next image, please. And you can see him dabbling in this over here. Of course, he's the one who loves to use classical drawing and painterly techniques, but applies them to subvert them. You never quite know whether you're looking at, at with him at a chorister singing a carol concert, a woman just about to, to perform fellatio. There's this very strange imbalance between sublimity and perversion, which of course is also designed to puncture Raphael's idealism, but at the same time he explores how do you capture the flux of emotion, of a thought. Now he works for photography, so I think Raphael wins. The motion of here is too frozen and it isn't quite as effective as Raphael's. Next image, please. Here we have a wonderful, huge painting by Tracy Emin. Tracy Emin was the one who really picked up on Raphael's emancipation of the woman, giving a parity, at least in painting, alongside men. You look, this is called The Memory of Tears from 2018. It's large. And you really look at this woman who really looks at you more than you are allowed to look at her. She has tears, 
she seems to have turned round spontaneously. There's a few haphazard lines on the right, which seem to indicate that her body is on the picture's right. And yet, if you try to look back at her, the eyes are opaque. The red eye is opaque through its own making, and the left eye is lined with these gray washes, probably washes of grief. So you really feel this thing that Raphael's Madonnas look at you, but they don't allow you to look back. They always stay slightly remote, independent, autonomous. The autonomy of the woman is beautifully captured over here, together with the grief of a contemporary artist. Next image, please. And of course, Warhol. Now we all know Warhol was brought up as a Byzantine Christian. He was from a very devout household. Again, don't forget that this is a huge painting. And when you look at it, you look at something that is actually larger than the Sistine Madonna by which it was inspired. And of course, with Catholicism, with Christian orthodoxy that so fascinated Warhol comes his other fascination, pop art, consumerism, the how, whole debasement of the image by multiplying it ad nauseum. You really feel that someone's taking a cheap reproduction of the Sistine Madonna, put a piece of tracing paper on it, traced all the most important lines, doubled it up for good value, added a price tag, and you can sell the whole thing with a little bit of red and a little bit of pink in any great place of pilgrimage like Lourdes or La Fatima and make some good money out of it. This is a wonderful work in that, of course, Warhol is always a deep thinker. $6.99, that's apparently the price tag. That's apparently the most ubiquitous price in the world. Everything when one doesn't quite know what price it should be is always $6.99. $6.9 is also a sexual position which avoids pregnancy. Um, it was one of the um, classic ways of um, contraception in the Middle Ages. But $6.99 is actually also a number which symbolizes in the symbolism of numbers, a time when you should be sloughing off your material properties and prepare for death. It is amazing to think that Warhol died two years after creating this image. So this complexity and is putting the reverence of spiritual imagery through the pop lens here, courtesy of Andy Warhol. Our last image, Coming up now. Now, this is, of course, is a great Raphael. I've always had a problem with it. It's the Ascension. I've never really liked it. Now, now I understand why, why recently it was shown that the lower part of the image is again by Giulio Romano, with only the upper part is by Raphael. But look what he's created. You really feel that Jesus is kept in a kind of shockwave of a nuclear explosion in slow motion as all the floating disciples around him are pressed to the side by this wave, this shock wave that in turn turbo drives Jesus into the heaven. This is an amazing capturing of the power of what it must be to be transfigured and ascend to the stars. And this inspired, and that's our last image, Bill Viola. Bill Viola, of course, is a man who uses video moving image to show different altered states, and you really get a sense. This is one of his five angels. It's actually called the ascending angel. As this man slowly emerges from the water, and as you well know in Bill Viola, goes upwards in an altered state that could be anything from a spiritual transfiguration through just a personal trauma. I want to end with this, mainly because I believe this is a very powerful image that actually takes you back to how people must have felt about Raphael at the beginning. People would have not been connoisseurs loving the finesse of what Raphael does. They would have loved his power, the power of the women, the power of expressing movement. And this is the power we have lost in appreciating uh, Raphael these days. And I think this image just captures that sort of power as Raphael would have transmitted during the time of his short life. This is the end of my talk and I will hand back to Nadine. Thank you so much, Alard, for a truly fascinating presentation. Um, of course, there are so many questions and we'll try to get as many as we can 
in the time we have left. Let's see. Um, Let's see, just, there's so many. Uh, here's a question from Funda, um, who would like to know, what do you think is the best book to describe Raphael? Now there are many books to describe Raphael, and it's amazing to find that many of them are actually 19th century. Now there's a 19th century book, which today is quite outdated, I'd have to look at the author, but I've always found that that is the most precise way of rendering Raphael. Today, we live in a time um, where Raphael often is viewed with a degree of skepticism, even cynicism. So I would need to find the name of that author. It's a very obscure book, but I think it captures the fascination with Raphael, as I hope it will be discovered in the next few years. Um, if you can capture that woman's name, I'll be happy to send her the name. Thank you. Um, question from Constance. Uh, could you please explain why Raphael is an angel who fell from heaven? Well, um, that's because Vasari, the first biographer of Raphael, said so. And it's been used very much to um, idealize uh, Raphael. And in a way, he has become a victim of that success. He was an angel because he looked angelic and he was an angel because he had excellent social manners as opposed to the remote Leonardo da Vinci and the cantankerous Michelangelo. He was the great harmonizer. You may notice that I have shown you no battles, no friction, no wars, no fires. Those things Raphael painted as well, but he didn't do it very successfully. He really was best at painting harmony, at painting the consensus of things. He was as great at that in his compositions as he was in managing projects. I mean, in the end, he was in charge of building St. Peter's after Donato Bramante died. And it was this angelic way of bringing together the most difficult people of his time um, and actually harmonize their endeavors and still do what he wanted. Thank you. Uh, a question from Michelle, um, who thanks you for your splendid talk and asks, do we know anything about the appearance of Raphael's mother, even her hair color? Well, we know she was called Maja. We know she was the one who died first. We know that he was extremely attached to her. Um, otherwise, we know very little. Now let's not forget, this is a moment in time where the artist is beginning to evolve from just being a menial, no different to a cook in the household of a courtier or a duke, to a superstar. That's a fast trajectory. Michelangelo was already a superstar. When Raphael was born, his father was a lowly artist. Yes, he was at a humanist court, he could read and write, but ultimately very little was taken down of any person's life who dabbled in the arts. We know he loved his mother, you can imagine that. We also know that he very much bemoaned her death. We also know he, he has a bit of a guilt complex because she had already picked out a wife for him and he wrote letter after letter long after she died saying, do you know there are too many great opportunities here in Rome? He was actually going to marry the um, relation of a cardinal and that rejecting his mother's final will also haunted him. As to hair color, I venture a guess that it would have been brown. Um, that was his hair color, but um, I don't think she will have been a blonde, even though of course that was the fashion of the day. <laughs> Probably a good guess. <laughs> uh, this I think is a really interesting question from Robert. Uh, when one looks at Raphael's philosophy, why was the painting unbalanced by the door on the lower left? Well, that's an interesting painting. If you actually stand in front of it, you, I could explain to you how actually um, Raphael makes a virtue out of a vice. That painting happens, the, the, it needs to go onto that wall. The door is not in the middle. So how do you, and he still has to paint it. So he has to find a way of balancing the composition despite the given factors of the room. 
uh, you will find actually, it's very interesting when you look at it, you'll find that there's certain densities of composition on the side, which is narrow, which gives more weight to the other side where personages are more loosely distributed. So you get, you make up what you like in space with density and still create a counterweight. If you were to stand in front of it, you wouldn't sense that. And that is one of the great genius aspects of Raphael's sense of composition. Great. Um, question from somebody likes to, uh, from one of our over 800 um, attendees and viewers, by the way, um, they would like to know, did Raphael sign all his works or is there a certain amount of attribution involved in identifying his works? It's a problem. And the, the problem is mainly that Raphael worked incredibly hard, of course, never got everything done and was quite happy to have a large workshop of often very talented other artists like Giulio Romano. You really often don't know where authentic Raphael ends and studio Raphael starts. So this authentication is an ongoing process and it is always difficult and one less and less resorts to technology and more to simply judgment because you really can often see that there is a subtle difference. Um, signing work is something you do, but you only do it when you become famous. So the later the work, the more guaranteed it is signed. And usually it is signed in a very lyrical way, in a book, like if Julius, the Pope is holding a book, you'll find it is signed by Raphael at the bottom, or indeed in a portrait by Raphael holding up the date. There are attributions like that. The danger is sometimes, not in fresco so much, but especially in oil painting, they could be superimposed. For example, if you think of um, the baker's daughter, his mistress, she has an armband. It says, Raphael made this. Now, there's been a lot of speculation. Someone removed the ring. Why did they keep the armband? Is the armband authentic? So, yes, he signed them often in interesting ways, but quite often others have dabbled with these over time, authenticating or disauthenticating them as to the political needs of the day. We have time for one final question uh, from John. Why has Raphael's reputation appeared to have fallen in recent years? Uh, the criticism seems to be too classical. Despite his 500th anniversary hurt by COVID, he doesn't get that many exhibitions. That's very true. Um, it's, um, I think, something that deserves inspection. But I do think it has to do with some very simple factors. Um, number one, Leonardo da Vinci got a huge upswing in interest due to the Da Vinci Code, the Dan Brown books. And we love mystery. And it's a treasure trail you get. It's a kind of criminalized treasure trail that you get when you discover what's in the Da Vinci Code. Um, so Leonardo is taken care of. Michelangelo has always been the man who people are most fascinated with partly because everyone knows the Sistine Chapel, but partly also because of his cantankerous temper. He demanded that popes would prostrate before him, pleading him to finish your work. So again, biographical elements play into that. Raphael, on the other hand, always got on well with people, uh, didn't have that notoriety. And on a more subliminal level, I do believe it has to do with what happened to Raphael in posterity. If you look at that angle painting, as beautiful it is, it is all the worst aspects of Raphael. It's academic. It does everything that painting does until the Impressionists debunk the academies and say, we can't bear this Raphaelite way of constructing perspective, of choosing colors. We want to move away from that. So he became a victim of his own success. And it was interesting in looking for contemporary comments on Raphael. If you put in Leonardo da Vinci contemporary art into your search machine, you come up with thousands of names. If you put in Raphael and contemporary artists, you come up with nothing. You have to really look. And all the artists I um, proposed to you as being inspired by Raphael really don't say it directly. They speak about it in a more indirect way. My final analysis would be that we live in a life, in a scene that loves disharmony, dissonance, scandal. Um, it 
relishes opening frictions. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that also in the way Cindy Sherman does it, in the way she says, no, she wasn't pretty and divine. She was actually exhausted and had big breasts. So we live in that readdressing idealism with realism. We live in that time. But trust me, there are many artists who are more and more turning back to Raphael for that very reason I outlined at the end, that he isn't just classical, but that he's also just plain powerful. And I hope that's the way we're going to go in the future. And that is a perfect way to, again, uh, this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Alard, for joining us all the way from London. Um, thank you again to the American Friends of the Lou for making this event possible. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Again, with over 800 uh, uh, visitors, viewers. Um, a, a recording will be shared with everyone. Uh, we can find that on our YouTube page. Um, and you can find out about uh, all our other upcoming programs on nationalartsclub.org. And with that, again, thank you so much. Danke schön. And I hope to see everyone soon. Please be safe and stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye now.